we go? Okay. Okay. Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Jonathan, and I'm going to talk about OpenStack or AWS or both. So this is the agenda, and note, it's not a technical deep dive. So for anyone who wants to know how many IOPS in an Amazon instance, how does that compare to OpenStack, and does an M1 large in AWS give me the same performance in OpenStack or anything like that, this is not that session. So it's going to be higher level. I'm going to discuss first comparing Amazon and um, OpenStack, um, some technical comparisons, and then I will discuss some of the use cases and business decisions you need to do on whether to do AWS or OpenStack, and then I'll end on how you can do both. Um, I'm going to do two brave things. I'm going to do live product demos, and I'm speaking before lunch. So there's an old saying is never make a long speech before f between people and food. So if your blood sugar is getting low and you're getting fidgety, I'll understand. So let's dive in. So OpenStack, a uh, quick review. What is it? It's pools of compute, networking, and storage that you manage through a dashboard or a command line. So what is AWS? It's a way to access servers, storage, and networking for you provision what you use and what you need. Now, you'll notice the pictures between the two are a bit different. So yes, Amazon has more services than OpenStack, but we'll see, um, we'll take that further. So this is what I'm going to discuss. Um, basically, the ones in blue I will go through today. Uh, the ones in black beneath know that they are available on both can take questions on those. So let's dive into, let's compare these services. So compute. So what is compute? Compute is a virtual machine. It's a store, it's a um, root disk, a network, and a boot volume that you boot up a virtual server. And it's determined by something called a template or a flavor is how big it is. The size means how much CPU, how much memory, and how much disk do you get? And you can often run packaged applications as well. So in Amazon, they're typically called a VM. In OpenStack, they're called an instance. And uh, what guest OSs do you get? So Amazon certifies guest OSs. And in OpenStack, it would be a good idea to run a certified guest OS because that gives you some level of assurance and some level of support when you, if you run into an issue. As was announced at the keynote this week, um, OpenStack now has apps.openstack.org, which is a marketplace of apps, and that compares somewhat to the AMI marketplace that you get in Amazon. So let's switch over and take a look. Let's see, so in compute in AWS, where there is something called an instance. I have running instances here, and I can launch a new instance such as Red Hat or um, other Linuxes or Windows. And similarly, in OpenStack, I have an overview. I get an overview dashboard like I had in AWS. I have, in this case, it's a demo system. So I have a running instance. And I can launch new running instances from the images that I have preloaded. So in this case, we see that there are uh, some Linux and Windows images that I've preloaded, and I can run those if I want to. You can also do it at the command line. So in uh, OpenStack, you see here that I did a Nova list, and that told me that I'm running a RHEL 7 instance, which is uh, this one here. And if I do it at the command line in uh, Amazon, I do a, where did it go? You see, this is really live. Uh, wrong window, sorry. It's, uh, no, sorry. Well, it's, you have the EC2 describe instances command. I lost the window, but I'll, I'll bring it up for the next one. And that would also give you um, EC2 dash describe dash instances would give you the same output as you got here. Uh, Cinder image list is a list of the images. 
that I have in uh, OpenStack, and I can do the same in AWS. So moving on, that was compute. Networking. So why do you need networking? So you want to connect instances to one another, and you want your users to be able to access your virtual machines and to get onto the internet. And you can manage um, things like what we call elastic IP addresses, which is a, a floating IP address, IP address ranges, DHCP, things like that. So comparing the two, in OpenStack it's called Neutron, used to be called Quantum. In AWS it's called Networking. They both have pretty much the same services, IP addressing, uh, load balancing. In AWS it's called ELB. Uh, you can firewall off your individual instances, which is control what's called egress or ingress, which is incoming uh, traffic or outgoing traffic. One thing that AWS does have that I highlighted there called VPC, which is Virtual Private Cloud, and that allows you to carve out a section of the AWS cloud for your exclusive use. Uh, looking at storage, so there's two kinds of storage. There's block storage and object storage. So block storage typically is for used for creating a volume. So in the Windows world, this would be like drive E, F, G, H that you add to your running Windows server. In the Linux world, this would be typically under slash MNT. And you can, and the second part is object storage, and object storage is for storing objects. So if you want a repository for storing files, for restoring uh, simple images, um, photographs, uh, Excel files, PDFs, just a place to store objects. So if we uh, switch over and take a look at those, so in OpenStack, there is this concept of volumes. And you see here that this one volume is attached to that rel instance I showed you on dev RDB. And I can create a new volume um, of whatever size. And similarly, in uh, AWS, I can go back to my console. And I have volumes here as well. I have running volumes as well. They could also be attached to instances. And uh, if I look at my OpenStack, so I have those three volumes there. And earlier I had run that thing called Cinder List. So that showed me the command line equivalent of doing it in the GUI, which is those three uh, volumes. The one you see in use is attached to that instance. And if you look, your eyes are probably better than mine, but that 0A9C uh, instance ID is this rel7 instance ID there. So, oh, I uh, didn't do um, object storage. So object storage in OpenStack is this concept of containers here. And I see here that I have this one container called C1. And what it is having it, it's got a PDF on Ceph. It's got a, an Excel file on compute uh, TCO. It's got a JPEG. and Similarly, if I went to what's known in Amazon, it's called S3. I have a bucket there called Jonathan Bucket, and there's a PDF. So you have the both functionality in both sides. So, that, so just to compare how storage is, um, in OpenStack, it's called Cinder. In AWS, it's called EBS. That's the block storage. The object storage, as you saw in AWS, it's S3. In uh, OpenStack, it's called Swift. So obviously, in AWS, you can only use the storage that they offer. In OpenStack, you can add your own storage. You can buy from a proprietary vendor, a NetApp, EMC, Veritas. You can uh, use a new thing called software-defined storage, which is Ceph, which is software-based storage on commodity hardware. Identity and security. So when you run your cloud, you want to authenticate and authorize users, control how people log in, things like key pairs, how they access their, um, their VMs. And on the security side as well, you want to firewall off your instances. So you only want to let, let certain traffic in or out. And you also want to control who can access both, um, who can actually access the VM. So in OpenStack, it's called Keystone. In AWS, it's called IAM, Identity Access Management. They both offer pretty much a um, virtual firewall. We can take a quick look. So in AWS, I see here, I'm logged in as myself, and uh, security, I've got this 
idea of credentials, so I can so I have this idea of my access key, which is what I used at the command line to um, access the instances and the password. And then similarly, on the OpenStack side, I have the identity here where I can uh, look. I'm logged in as the demo, so I would switch over and log in as admin. I do love cached passwords. So here, if I went over to identity, I'd get a list of the users. Uh, one of which I was running earlier was demo, and I can do things to that demo. I can create a user. I could look at the demo user and get his credentials, etc. And looking at the uh, firewalling, so in my, uh, I'll go back to my other user. So if I look at the instance here, access and security, um, there is the um, idea, I can set up groups, the security groups as to who can con get to the various instances. And I can do the same on uh, EC2. I can get security groups here as to who can get to the instances. Orchestration. So orchestration is the idea that you want to automate. So the cloud is not about doing single clicks like I was doing here with a nice GUI. It may be easy to do simple uh, steps, but you really want to orchestrate and automate. And how do you do that? So you think of the conductor in the orchestra. He brings in the violins and the cymbals and the drums and the cello at various points to create the music that we all hear and love. Me. Sorry. So you want to create that cloud application that should be as near perfect as the uh, music that you're getting out of the orchestra. So you need to bring in the storage, the networking, the security, add an image, add an instance, kill it as needed. So you want to have an automated method. So in OpenStack, it's called heat. In uh, AWS, it's called cloud formation. AWS uses something called templates. OpenStack uses something called text files. Let's check on time. So, oop, so we can just take a quick look. So here is cloud formation. So you create a stack of what you want to do in uh, EC2. And in uh, OpenStack, you have a stack as well. So you can go ahead and create a stack, which would be, again, networking, storage, VMs, security applications as you need. The user interface. So you have three kinds. You have the CLI, the command line interface, that you uh, saw me run some of those Cinder commands. You have the graphical user interface that you've seen in the Firefox browser. And you have the API for programmatic automation. So it serves two purposes. The administrators administer the cloud using those tools. And the end users provision what they need using those tools as well. So let's compare. So it's called the EC2 API for Amazon. Um, OpenStack has the OpenStack API, and there's a link there to a workable subset of APIs that are compatible with EC2. They both have a CLI. They have a GUI. In AWS, it's called the console. In uh, OpenStack, it's called Horizon. So we've seen pretty much the, uh, the command line and the GUI, as I've shown in the demos. So that was a brief overview of some of the common technical services offered by both. Now let's jump into some of the business characteristics. So an SLA. A SLA is a service level agreement. It's a guarantee of availability of the cloud. So why do you need it? Well, if you're running mission critical apps, you want to know that the cloud is there. And how do you? account for downtime, what, do you, what happens when your users complain, how do you, you're providing a service to the users, it should be up. So AWS in their SLA advertised 99.95%. OpenStack, you obviously are deploying yourself in your data center, so you negotiate that um, SLA with your IT team. Uh, note that Red Hat can certainly help you achieve a high SLA. 
And then in order to have that uh, idea of availability, you have, you have what's known as availability zones, which is groups of cloud services in different geographies. So you may run a cloud data center for OpenStack in, well, you want to California, you don't want to do that, there's earthquakes, so you'll run it in Nevada. Um, if land is cheap and, uh, and uh, no earthquakes, so you'll, there's lots of data centers in Nevada. You may run another one in Virginia on the East Coast. You may, and then you duplicate, so you can run services in both. So if there's one data center has any kind of failure or a rack there in failure, you can fail over to the other zone. And AWS has that as well. One thing uh, to talk about the SLA, while adver um, Amazon adv advertised their SLA, they also have what's known as the liability agreement. It's not linked here, but I can discuss that afterwards. And that is, um, they do have certain disclaimers as to what happens if there is an outage and where their responsibility lies for your services and your data. And that will come up soon. So who owns the data? Okay, you're storing data in the cloud. Who owns it and who can access it? Right, so users want to know who can access it. Uh, certain industries have legal regulations. There's HIPAA, there's SOX, there's GLBA, there is FISMA. Lots of legal regulations as to who has access to data in the cloud. And there are some overseas countries that have concerns that the United States security agencies can demand access to public cloud data. So in OpenStack and in AWS, you pretty much own your data, and you are responsible for it. OK? So um, Amazon is saying, again, they advertise that SLA. They also have the liability agreement that I, can, uh, I will bring up on the screen as to if there is an outage, what are they liable for? And if you read the fine print, they are liable for a refund, pretty much. Um, OpenStack, on the, other on the other hand, you're controlling the data. Your IT group is keeping the servers running. You're putting the data there. You control it. So you need to have best practices, security, and policies for the data that you're putting out there in both instances. So ecosystem. What's an ecosystem? Are, you're not in the cloud on your own, okay? You are there and you want and need a group of peers and people that will support you. So OpenStack has this com great community of hundreds of companies and thousands of developers that are contributing to the code and running um, message boards and email lists where people are posting and answering questions. And Amazon has the same. They also have a variety of posting boards and places where you can get help from your peers for assistance. Why is it important? So your cloud needs to be reliable, secure, and supported, right? So Amazon will tell you all the various vendors and all the precautions that they run to uh, keep the cloud running and all the people, the vendors that they partner with. When you do OpenStack inside your data center, you want to also have a group of vendors that you partner with that help you keep that cloud running. So you'll want consultants. You'll want to run your OpenStack on certified hardware so that if there is a problem with a driver, if there's a problem with any kind of failure, you can go to that hardware vendor and get support from them. If you get uh, OpenStack from a, a distro, from a certified vendor, then that vendor, like Red Hat, will work together with that hardware vendor and support the issue and help you resolve those issues. So having that certified hardware ecosystem is really important. <coughs> so the ecosystems pretty much uh, compare side by side with the difference, as I said, in OpenStack is that high hardware community. Um, the, uh, the, you, there is no hardware that you know of on the AWS side, you have no idea really what it's running on. It's not really your business. You just want to know from Amazon through their SLA and through their liability agreement that they are providing you with a service 
on the when you're running the cloud in your own data center, you want to really have that hardware certification available so that you can go to that vendor when you have a problem. The cost. Everybody wants to know how the cost compares. So I try to find as many currencies as I could. I have dollar, yen, pound, euro. Apologies to anyone that I have omitted. So there's operational cost and there is capex cost. Okay. So Amazon, when you go off to Amazon, let's switch back to the browser. Wake, wake everyone up. If I want to go off to Amazon and uh, launch an instance or sign up, let me sign out. Okay, so when I go to Amazon and I um, want to use their services, they have different kinds of pricing models. Pay as you go and other pricing. So, um, switch back. So, pay as you, so OPEX versus CAPEX. So operational expense is an expense that you usually write off every month against a different kind of budget, and that is um, a certain a set amount that is written off every month against a predetermined amount for some number of months or years. Capital expense is money that you lay out up front, so, um, and you need to write a large check in the beginning. So one, com one idea to think about the two is when you buy a car, if you go into the dealership and you pay cash, that's a capital expense. You're writing a $20,000 check on the spot. And if you lease the car, that's a bit more of an operational expense because you're paying $250 a month for the next 48 months. So that's an illustrate analogy of CapEx versus OpEx. So when, a when Amazon does what they saw there as pay as you go, that is OpEx. So you sign up with a credit card and you use their services and at the end of the month you get a bill and you put that on your expense report, send it into your boss, he approves it, and that's pay as you go operational expense. So the other, the other way of uh, capital expense they have is what's known as reserved instances. Let's jump here to the slide. So um, you can do OPEX, uh, credit card billing by the hour, or you can pre-purchase blocks of usage, which is called reserved instances. In that case, you go off and you buy X number of hours and use them or you don't use them. OpenStack, you have two kinds of expenses. You need to buy the hardware, so that's usually a capital expense. And then you need to get the software and the people to run it. So you can get the uh, software from a distributor and you can license that or you can do uh, the Red Hat model which is subscription and that typically goes against uh, OPEX, where you pay a fixed amount every month for services, support, and the right to use the software. Or you can go the route of doing it yourself. And doing it yourself means you buy the hardware, you download OpenStack from the foundation, and then you have to hire people to run it, install it, and maintain it. Python engineers are not cheap and not e so easy to find, so there's an certain risk that one can say taking that uh, path versus using a supported vendor. One thing to bear in mind when one looks at um, uh, the Amazon pricing is there are certain costs that are not always apparent. And this applies to both OpenStack and Amazon. So in Amazon, um, it may you um, sign up for a service and you, it advertises as so much cents per hour or per minute, and then you may need to use other services. And one example that I was discussing with uh, someone yesterday is um, certain IOPS. So IOPS is a certain performance that you want to get out of a disk volume. And if you go into uh, the Amazon model of doing that, there are different grades of performance. You can get a fast, a fast volume for a higher price, or you can get a slower volume for a cheaper price. And how does that compare if I do it in OpenStack? Do I use SSDs? Do I use uh, RAID? How, do, you know, how does one compare these two options? So there, that's another example of two different kinds of cost models. You're buying disks for your OpenStack or you're using the 
the Amazon pricing for their different speeds of volume. So which do you use? So we saw here that we have certain compute storage and networking security services that are quite similar uh, between Amazon and AWS. There are certain different uh, risks and things to consider in terms of SLA, data ownership, consulting services. So which do you use? So costs can escalate in the public cloud. It looks very attractive when you swipe the credit card and you um, start using services. But when you leave the servers running there 24 by 7 and forget about them, you get that bill at the end of the month. And that's not really a predictable cost because you started off at, an, at a credit card expense and now you've been adding services. And you don't really know at, ahead of time how much you were expecting to spend. On the flip side, when you build it in, inside, you need to buy the hardware and you need to have personnel or to pay a vendor for the help. And as we discussed, there are security and regulatory acquire, requirements between industries and countries. I think it boils down to use cases, right? What are the use cases for AWS versus OpenStack? So if you have users that are scattered around the world, Amazon already has data centers that are worldwide. So you may want to consider maybe at least front-ending Amazon at the data centers that are close to your customers to reduce that latency and then putting maybe more customer-sensitive um, customer data back in your data center on OpenStack under your control. Are you doing uh, development? So both Amazon and uh, OpenStack, you can add platform as a service to that. Um, elastic workload, so both platforms are very good at um, demand growing and shrinking. So that's what elasticity means, is you're, um, you're expanding your cloud, horizontally scaling, adding servers as you need them, and reducing servers as you don't need them. High performance computing. So um, when you want to do very data intensive, CPU intensive work, it may work better to do that in your own data center where you have a lot more control over the hardware. And you can add things like I discussed earlier as high performance SSD drives for some of that um, specialized work. Whereas in Amazon, you have to go with their pricing model over a higher performing volume. You're not quite sure because it's a very shared infrastructure. You're not really sure of the level of service you're getting. So that may be a use case for doing it inside. When you do OpenStack inside, you can really do dedicated resources and segregate your users. So I, um, th this idea of multi-tenancy that I had in parentheses right in the original slide, and I can go back to the demo briefly. So in OpenStack, um, multi-tenancy or shared services means So here, projects. So in OpenStack, you can create a project, right, that you can set how much of the resources that project is allowed to use. And you have this more control over multi-tenancy over, so you can have a, um, you can have a um, demo project here. So I have a demo project, I can, uh, create another project called engineering. I can create one called uh, marketing, create one called sales. I can put the members into them, and I can set the quotas to how much resources they get. So that is what I meant by segregation and multi-tenancy. So that would be a very good use case for OpenStack, where you really want to segregate users into defined groups, into um, by organization, sales, marketing, engineering, by your customers, maybe um, retail customers, wholesale customers, by your partners. You give them each a project. You can define their quota, how much CPU, disk, and memory out of your OpenStack cloud that you get. In uh, AWS, you don't really have that level of segregation. All you can really do is create a VPC, a virtual private cloud, 
where you go into Amazon, carve out a section of their shared resources, and give it to your different users. So doing that segregation and dedicated resources is a better use case for OpenStack. Um, finally, we'll get to what's called hybrid cloud, which is using both. So how do you manage both OpenStack and AWS if you have applications running in both? So you get something called a cloud management platform, which is the ability to use both the private and the public cloud. And for, I'll end here with our open hybrid cloud, which has uh, your physical servers, your Linux, the OpenStack, and the CloudForms cloud management. And go back to our demo, where we see here I'm logged into my CloudForms management engine, and I have a view here into my private cloud of uh, VMware, OpenStack, Micro Red Hat, Microsoft. So I have my private cloud by uh, vendor. I have public cloud of uh, AWS. You get a global view. Um, lots of information that you can get, but a, a, a tool to manage both the hybrid and the public the hybrid cloud, meaning both your public and your private cloud. You can configure, you can optimize, you can do automation, you can do control. Um, lots of options. I can't go into further. This is being run downstairs in the booth, so I was told not to mess with their demo, just show the front screen, not mess up anything they're doing. There is a Manage IQ, which is the open source version of CloudForms running this afternoon in uh, East Building. I can direct you there if you, there's a half day workshop where you can get to play on Manage IQ, run a lab, and really learn how to manage both private and public cloud. So I will end here. We have seven minutes extra lunchtime or questions if anyone has. Yeah. So you can do the, you can move VMs between um, the two. Yeah, or, 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 the autom or the automate. I can't do it here because it's a, I'm a read-only user, but if you go to the booth downstairs, they can tell you more about that. Or to the session this afternoon. Yeah. It's how it, you, however you define your <coughs> um, connection to either cloud. So you set up the connection, and it's, you, it is uh, typically an SSL connection, yeah. So like you would need to set up a VPC, like a service from the cloud provider first, and then Well, no, you use your AWS credentials, like I logged into, the, into AWS. Just like I logged into the console, use that, those similar type of credentials to lo lo authenticate your secret and your access key. No, no. Yes. 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 Service catalog, yes, yes. Is that the demo in the marketplace? Um, I've got the room. I can bring it up. Uh, From today and tomorrow? It's this afternoon now. It's at 1.50. Okay. I'll, I'll find the session. I, I, wrote it. I think I put it down. Yes, yeah. East, I knew it was east side. East room one. Yes, the other side. No, not application data. Yeah. Not yet. Okay. Thanks.